there it is. Uh, oh, good, they got it. Um, so let's see. Where's Marta? I was wondering if Marta could, uh, if Jasim, if you could put up that little bio. It's not entirely correct. I showed it to Louis. <laughs> I showed it to Laura, and it wasn't quite right. But we, it, all the facts weren't correct. But we got the fact here with us. You'll probably get fired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just a second. Um, yeah. Okay. Hey, Laura, this will, you, is... will you do a fact check for us afterwards and say what he made up? Sure. Yeah. You know, this is a, a Laura goes to bed early and wakes up very early. So, you know, out of the goodness of her heart and everything and in her service to Baba, she's like, you know, <laughs> making the all college effort. Okay. Dear folks of Baba, we have had a few guest speakers from the younger generations, including Laurence, Sven, White. Margie, Laura Smith, our guest for this Sunday's Between My Generation and Margie's. She grew up here in Myrtle Beach and was bright, joyous, fun loving, and carefree presence at the center. Her parents, Craig and Louise, moved here in 1971 to be near the center and be a part of the Baba community. They had the good, great good fortune to attend the 69 Darshan in India, but Laura was not yet born. In her teenage years, Laura was an enthusiastic participant in the youth Sahabas and then went on to college where she faced some of the temptations that many from our generation dealt with. She, she speaks very openly about her college struggles and Baba's help during that period of her life. You will find her perspective unique and refreshing. As many of you know, she works at Cherry R Books as a most welcoming manager, along with her genial sidekick, Sheila. And a trip to the center often includes a delightful Baba-filled visit to the bookstore. Baba is Laura's everything, and she speaks very frankly and openly about her struggles and the heartbreaks in her life with him and also Mara. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, on, don't think about trash. And recycling. Oh, Laura, yeah, Laura. Uh, this is one thing I th uh, I remember from Laura. I mean, she was. She would come on the center, um, you know, she was upright and blonde, you know, blonde haired girl running around. But one day she came and she had had a Baba dream with where her, she and her mother went and met Baba in the dream. So she was telling everybody, you know, uh, the, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, all about this dream and, you know, the nearby community and everything. And all day long, you know, she uh, would tell people, but she didn't tell her mother, Louise. But um, finally, at, toward the end of the day, Louise, you know, kind of couldn't help but ask, you know, Laura, you've told everybody else about your dream, but you never told me about your dream. <laughs> and Laura said, why should I tell you? You were in it. <laughs> <laughs> So mm -hmm. that's the, that's the, 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 you know, that's what you, you know, you come up with those great thoughts like that when you're a kid. <laughs> but uh, so, Laura, I mean, as I writ, wrote in there, it's really fun to go over to the bookstore because she and, uh, and Sheila are just great. I mean, and they have coffee there. And I mean, it's, it's another, uh, we're going to say it, the annex to the center. They really make it fun and uh, you're not just customers, you know. So good. Anyway, Laura, you go ahead. And oh, uh, let me mention: you ask her questions along the way. Be feel free. I mean, she's uh, and she's got a lot of unique uh, uh, experiences that are well worth hearing. Okay. Jay Baba. 
Yeah. Okay. Baba. Hey, Baba, everybody. Yeah. So um, this, I'm really honored and excited to uh, connect with everybody uh, and tell my story, which having been in 12-step groups for 34 years, I've done many times, but um, most of those times have been with the theme of drug and alcohol abuse. Um, mm -hmm. and tonight, it's going to be Baba, which is even better. So, um, yeah, I know how these things can go, and I know how I can end up just talking about God knows before the age of 10, and I don't want to get stuck um, in certain areas. I want to be able to get to how alive Baba is in my life right now. So, um Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be interrupted, but so what is there anything else I need to know about like the structure of this meeting? Uh, mm -hmm. Other than I can be interrupted with questions, but yeah, it's no, an hour. Yeah, a little over an hour, oh. and 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 it's any way you want to style it. But uh, you know, and there'll probably questions that come along the way, or even clarification, but. Yeah, yeah, but like you say, how you experience Baba today, of course, is eventually you get to that, and that's uh, very nice. Okay, well, but like I'm say, just you know, be growing like, up, hurry the hell yeah. up if I get stuck. Just, just yeah, keep, I, I don't just think you going. will. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So, a um, couple of corrections to my bio. Um, well, I'll just start from the beginning. So. Um, my parents met in uh, at Cornell University and got married soon after. Um, they, my dad, went to graduate school at NC State, and that's where they. Um, my dad and my mom were a little older than the hippies. They were like hippie wannabes, and um, you know, my dad was into the beatniks and. Um, you know, he jumped freight trains cross country and stuff. He, he just really wanted to be a bohemian. That was his dream. And hippies to him were like the next generation of that. So um, so he wanted to be a hippie. And, and But he was, uh, both of my parents are scientific backgrounds and they wanted to, uh, they were atheists pretty much. They grew up in Christian backgrounds, but so my dad was at a party in, I guess it was Raleigh or Chapel Hill uh, with a bunch of hippies. And he ran into a poster of Mayor Baba. And the poster was the ancient one picture. And it said beneath it, um, I was Rama, I was Krishna, I was this one, I was that one. And now I'm Mayor Baba. And my dad thought, who the hell does this guy think he is, you know? <laughs> and then right right below it, there was a paragraph, which I've never seen this exact poster, but that's what he said. Below that, there was a paragraph. <laughs> it's the one that's in um, part of the, what's in Stay With God, where Baba talks about uh, the ohm sound, how it was the original sound of creation, and that the way that you make the sound is you put your lips together and you make a... Mm, sound so that's all Baba wrote all that out very detailed how to make the sound and um, my dad made that sound and when he did he started weeping he he recognized Baba at the sound of of the ohm and looking at his picture so for him it was pretty instantaneous my mother took a little longer. So that was probably 67 or 68. And then they moved to um, Myrtle Beach. My dad wanted to sail around the world. They were both into sailing and nature and they had a sailboat and they were living in New York. Uh, well, they were in New York for some reason. Anyway, they came down from New York and um, they, um, what happened then? They kind of stopped along oh, so the way. Yeah, they were going to go around the world, but they stopped in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> <laughs> they went from New York to Myrtle Beach, pretty much down the, um, you know, the waterway, the uh, intercoastal waterway. But anyway, um, so they got down here. Oh, so no, they came to the center to visit first. Sorry. And my mother came and she slowly, she was having troubles uh, with her marriage and life and 
she felt Baba say to her, I am your only real lover. And that was uh, a switch for her. Um, but after they both fell for Baba, they moved to Myrtle Beach. And that was around, I believe it was 68. My sister, Shelly, was seven years old at the time. So um, I just wanted to add that on that sailboat, uh, they had a sail and Lynn Ott painted Baba's face on the sail of their sailboat. Huge. We have a slide of it somewhere. I wish I had organized myself with pictures, but I didn't. Anyway, uh, and, and there's this funny story about a Baba lover being on the beach and seeing my parents' boat with Baba's face and thinking they were seeing it, you know, having a vision or something. <laughs> but um, anyway, so yeah, they moved here in 68. And then, in, of course, they were planning to go to the 69 Darshan. And they did. Uh, of course, Baba passed. But they went in 69 with my sister, who was seven at the time. Um, and they came back and they lived here in Myrtle Beach until 1979. So um, I was born here in 71 at the Ocean View Memorial Hospital. I like to say it was in memory of the Ocean View that was there before they built the hospital. <laughs> anyway, and so- And that was donated, given uh, to the, the city by Elizabeth. That's right. That, that yeah. hospital, yeah. That's right. And that, um, so- it wasn't until I was in college that I had an assignment in one of my classes to find out about what my, you know, when I was born, what was the situation? What was my birth like? I had to interview my mom for a paper that I found out that Kitty and Elizabeth came to the hospital to meet me there, which is awesome and astounding. My mom said they brought, you know, baby blankets and anyway, it was very sweet. Um, so right after I got out of the hospital, my mom said that she took me down to the ocean on the Baba Center Beach in February <laughs> and uh, put some ocean water on me and babatized me. So I'm officially the first babatized baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I grew up on the center um, just till I was eight. And then we moved to New York because my dad wanted to uh, follow his dream of becoming an actor. Uh, which was what his father did and his my great grandparents as well. Um, so Myrtle Beach, grown up on the center, was wonderful. I remember I have so many fond memories. I remember standing on the little hill by the lagoon cabin, you know, that goes slopes down to the original kitchen, thinking it was a ginormous hill. You know, I mean, I had to be three. Um, I remember there being cats that lived there that ate over by the original kitchen. Um, of course, I remember Kitty zipping around on the golf cart. And I remember mostly Elizabeth, just the way she walked. Um, and I really have fond memories of watching films in the meeting place in the 70s because none of the films had gotten... Um, uh, soundtracks yet. And so there was this gorgeous, like clackety clack of the old, just the projector, you know, all you heard was the projector and you saw Baba. And I kind of missed that. That was really something, I don't know, raw about it. And, um, you know, the rock stars, Bob Brown and Jim Meyer were, were there. And I kind of had a, a kid crush on Jim Meyer. He was so gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I and I remember when Adi came, which was what seventy eight or seventy seven. Yeah, almost um, every year in there during that period. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know which year it was, but I remember him being in the meeting place, and even at that age, thinking, "What are these stupid questions that they are asking this poor man?" <laughs> the questions they were asking, and I vaguely remember somebody asking like why men don't get pregnant or something just so stupid i couldn't believe how stupid it was but <laughs> but he put up with us and um and um just the atmosphere on the center was wonderful same as it is now still wonderful um so then uh we moved to new york in 79 onto long island in a beautiful little uh town called seacliff 
which uh, incidentally, um, Madame Popoff, who was a uh, Gurdjieff follower and who met Baba, lived in Seacliff. Seacliff is one square mile. It's a tiny little place. My parents lived there from, and they went to the 69 Darshan. Madame Popoff lived there. She met Baba. And many, many years later, I discovered in the guest book that's in the uh, in Baba's house that has all the signatures from the 1958 uh, visit, that there was a woman in there whose address was Seacliff. And um, long story, but anyway, I contacted her great, great granddaughter and we hit it off and I've yet to get her to the center, but I will do that. Um, but she lived, you know, in Seacliff and met Baba, went to the 58. So it's amazing, but it's a beautiful little place, great place to grow up. Um, I was always a very wide open, wild kid. My parents were, you know, free range parents didn't exist back then, but that's what they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were ahead of their time or behind, I don't know. But um, I remember Marshall liked to tell me that the first time he saw me, I was on the roof of my parents' house and I was four years old. <laughs> So I would, you know, I climbed all over. I, uh, you know, I'm sure people tried to get me out of the meeting place for being loud. And they used to have a beautiful swing right outside the meeting place that kids could swing in. And they also had a, a May Day celebration. Do you remember that, Jeff? They they had a maypole and all the little yeah. kids had the strings around the maypole. Anyway, there were some sweet things there. Um, and the other kids around at that time were like... Uh, Molly Hay, who's now Molly Arani, and Johanna Hagelthorne, Mara Dennison, um, uh, what's her name, Jennifer Wilson, and Jeremy Wilson. Anyway, um, mm. so we went to New York, um, and I was like, I was hanging out with some just I always wanted to move to New York for some reason, I guess because my parents are New Yorkers originally. So I, I felt like I was going to the homeland or something when we went up to New York. And um, I met, the first person I met was my neighbor who was very, you know, I was like barefoot all the time, you know, tar heel type person, cut off jean shirts, shorts, I cursed like a sailor. I, I was, uh, yeah, I was fun loving and bright, but also kind of, wild very wild and um so it was more of an awkward transition than i thought it would be you know um but it was still good it was great sea cliff was great um so grade school was good um when i got into like junior high i really got picked on mercilessly picked on um really still to this day, the worst two years of my life was middle school and the abuse that I endured. And I don't know what my past life situation is, but I refuse to leave the school. I mean, looking back, I'm like, why did I do that? I, I could have just left. My parents offered to take me out, but I was like a soldier, like, hell no, they're not going to win. I don't know why, but that's where I was coming from um what 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 uh, what why were they abusing you what was or what were they abusing you about you know it's funny it was never baba you know my yeah. sister got teased for baba but in new york he wasn't a big enough thing i guess yeah um it, i you know they made up stuff it wasn't even true there wasn't anything i think they were just jealous honestly i think yeah. i don't know you know girls get like that teenage girl of that age, unfortunately, is horrific. But um, yeah, so that was really bad. And I survived that and um, started, I think it was, yeah, when I was in the eighth grade, I got a boyfriend two years older than me. So he was like, older than the kids that were the older kids that were abusing me. And, um, you know, I've always been boy crazy. So, you know, that was a mess. But um so, so that was, he, he was kind of my savior. His name was Mike and he eventually went to India and met the Mondali and it was, it's a good, it's a good story. 
But um, so I started smoking cigarettes and drinking and stuff like that, probably around 13, um, just with the neighborhood kids that I was still friends with. But I, I was really in a bad way after the uh, abuse of middle school, people threatening to beat me up every day, spitting in my hair, stuff like that. Um, and then I got this boyfriend and he drank and that was just kind of my ticket out of there. Um, and then when I was 14, I was raped by one of the friends of my boyfriend in a park. And that was like, that's what put my, you know, career in drinking and alcohol and drugs into fifth gear. After that happened, I was off to the races. Um, I really didn't have, I guess I didn't feel my parents were safe enough to tell about it. A um, couple of my friends said they were going to help me out and then turned on me. So it was just, it wasn't safe to deal with that at the time where I didn't think it was. And um, so things got, went from bad to worse and my addiction got worse. I got heavier in, into all kinds of drugs, a lot of hallucinogenics. Um, so, okay, let me back up a little. So 1984, I was 13 and my parents didn't know what to do about my situation uh, with the kids that were being awful. And their solution was take her to India. So in 1984, I went to India for the first time. And um, let's see. So that was really life changing for me in a, many ways, but primarily because I got out of that environment for a little while. And um, I made friends with some Australian kids and I got to perform uh, some singing and dancing for Mara and Mani and um, got to meet Mara. I don't know that I would have got there sooner. It was many years later that I realized what a bargain it was to go through that shit to meet Mara and Mani. So um, in any case, so that was 1984. Then I came back and I think I got raped after that, actually. And it just got worse. And then in um, 1988, I was starting to want to get out of the drug situation. By the way, Mayor Baba, I knew, of course, that he was against drugs. And I knew that I was way off course. Uh, I didn't see a lot of other options at the time. Um, I'm backtrack one quick, cute story, which is kind of how, you know, I mean, I had the background with Baba on the center. Um, and then I had uh, my kind of, my coming to Baba's story takes 20 seconds. <laughs> I was... It was my first trip to India. I was 13. I was walking up the hill from the PC to the Samadhi for the first time. And I thought to myself, all these years I've accepted Baba for who he says he is, but how do I know that's real for me? How do I know that's not just my parents thing, whatever. So I decided in a dramatic teenager fashion that I would either stay with Baba or leave him um, depending on my response to the Samadhi. So 10 seconds later, I crossed the threshold and I was just faucets. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm staying with Baba. So <laughs> that was my coming to Baba story. Um, so then, like I said, I knew that Baba didn't want me doing drugs. And I, oh, when I was also around the 13, 14, I started referring to Baba as Bob. And I would, you know, we had pictures all over our house. So I would walk through the house and I'd say, hey, Bob, what's up, Bob? How you doing, Bob? Like I'd talk to him, I'd call him Bob. And I was really into rock and roll and I would drive everybody crazy, changing the channels on the, you know, stereo in the car. Although my dad was very tolerant. When, the, when Hendrix would come on, my dad would crank it all the way up. <laughs> 
But anyway, um, so one day we're in the car and I'm doing this irritating thing and on comes a Who song. Uh, uh, everybody probably knows Pete Townsend is a follower of Mayor Baba. And there's some Who songs that are very Baba, like Bargain and I forget, what is it? Baba O'Reilly, Teenage Wasteland. Anyway, one of one of the Baba Who songs is on the radio. I think it was, you know, one and one don't make two, one and one make one, you know that. And at the end of the song, the DJ comes on the radio and he says, and that was a dedication to Laura from Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Blew my mind. Totally. Blew my mind. So that was kind of, oh my God, this is real kind of thing experience. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay. So. The drugs started getting bad. Um, I went, I got a therapist that was helpful, uh, but it really wasn't enough. I, I went to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting up in New York and they told me that alcohol was also a drug and I didn't like that at all. And, um, and then I was getting around the time to graduate high school and uh, I decided that I needed that New York was my problem, that I needed to get out of New York. You know, I would maybe be able to get off the drugs and stuff if I got out of New York. Okay, I got to back up again. Sorry. So 1988, I went to India again, this time because of the drugs and alcohol looking, you know, hoping Baba could help me. That was, I think, before I'd been to any meetings. Yes, that is before I'd been to any meetings. So that trip um was wonderful in a million different ways but um i guess the first important one was i went oh god here's the most this is unbelievable okay so it was one of those trips it was just me and my mother 1988 it was one of those trips where everything goes wrong like the flights got canceled we were stuck in airports for hours and hours and hours to this day, I remember exactly what I was wearing because I think I wore it for four days. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole time that we were, you know, trying to get there, I kept thinking to myself, the minute I get there, the minute I get there, I'm going to drop my bags. I'm going to go straight up to the Samadhi. The minute I get there, I'm going to drop my bags. I'm going to go straight up to the Samadhi. So um, I did that. As soon as we got to the PC, we checked in, I dropped my bags, I went right up to the Samadhi, probably afternoon sometime. And this is when this happened, people. I'm walking up the hill and there is nobody there. Nobody, 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 nobody. Nobody standing there, nobody, completely empty. And I have this like tunnel vision, I'm going, this is my plan, I've been saying it for days, I'm gonna walk straight in. I walk over the threshold and I going to the Samadhi and behind me in the right corner is Mohammed, the must. Okay. And I barely register that he's there. Cause I'm like, I'm going in, I'm going in. And he was sitting back there. He was going like this, like this. And I'm like, whatever, like, I don't even care at first because I'm so focused and I go through and I put my head down. I'm like, oh, Bob, I'm here. Thank God. A uh, few seconds in, I think to myself, holy shit, I'm in the Samadhi with Muhammad. And I start freaking out. I'm like, wait a minute, this guy's on the fifth plane. He can read all my mind, all my thoughts. He knows me better than I know myself. He knows all my lifetimes. He knows my past, my future. <laughs> I start, I start freaking out. <laughs> and um, and uh, and then of course my mind is like, I start thinking violent thoughts, sexual thoughts, everything horrific is blah, just coming out of me. And I'm like, oh my God, get me out of here. And I practically ran out of there. And it wasn't for years later until people told me like, Muhammad never went up to the tomb. Like that's really rare. Are you sure it happened? I'm like, I'm sure there was nobody there. Anyway, I feel I'm really lucky to have been caught in the crossfire at that particular day. But um, so another great thing that happened to me on that trip is that 
uh, I connected with Nana Care, who was the guy who stood by the Samadhi giving out Prasad. That's who he was to me. It was a lot more than that. But um, I just loved the hell out of him. I really did. I just felt a connection with him. Um, I also felt a great connection with Pendu, who I met in 84 when I was 13. Everybody would go into Mondali Hall to hear Erich, and I would sit outside with Pendu, who, as you might remember, injured his tongue in the second accident and was just like drooling. You can understand a word he said, but I just loved him. I would hang out with Pendu. Anyway, um, so back to Nanacare. So one day uh, when I was 17, yeah, when I was 17, I walked in, I was going to the Samadhi and there weren't a lot of people around. It wasn't RT. And Nanacare stops me on the way out and says, which books of Baba have you read? And I quickly start bullshitting, <laughs> saying, oh, a little of this and a little of that, which was true, but, you know, like, not a lot. And um, so Nana Care says, come with me. And he takes me over to the little Maribad library there up on the hill. And there's a bench in there and there's some uh, bookshelves with like glass cases. And behind that is, behind him is a painting or a photograph of Baba and he sits across the table from me and he pulls out a book and it was um Alan Cohen's The Mastery of Consciousness book that he chose and he put the book down and it literally opened to chapter 11 and the number 11 is very important to me now and just recently realized it was chapter 11 but anyway opens up and the chapter is on remembrance. Um, and Nana Care begins to tell me in a, a thousand different ways how important it is to remember Mayor Baba in everything you do uh, before, you know, everything you do, it's like a net that protects you from the mosquitoes of desires. And uh, he just went, he got into like a, I don't know, it was almost like he was possessed. He j I couldn't get a word in edgewise. He was letting me know what I needed to know. And as he was talking, I had this experience that the whole, everything in the room became like smoke. Like you could just put your hand, right? Nothing was real. It was exactly what he was saying was true as he was saying it. And the only things that were stable in the room were his eyes, and Baba's picture behind him. Everything else was like you could have just walked through the wall. None of it, none of it had any substance to it. So, as you can imagine, that made a really big impression on me. So I took the book and I went down to the PC and I just devoured it, took notes, was totally obsessed with it. It's a great book, out of print, unfortunately, but um. And I had all kinds of experiences with that book. Um, the main one being that I plugged into what Baba says about the provisional ego, which you guys probably know, but it's when Baba says you can take on this kind of temporary ego to protect you from uh, continuing to build on your own by waking up in the morning saying it's Baba waking up before you go to work, it's Baba going to work before you go to bed, you know, whatever you're doing, it's Baba doing it. So, and also just repetition of his name. And so for, I don't know, about three days, I repeated Baba's name constantly, constantly, const even in my sleep, I've never been able to do that since, but even in my sleep and, um, I started to see Baba everywhere in the in the rocks, in the trees, in the sky. I saw him everywhere. And that also made a big impression on me. Um, and, and the provisional ego. And then, um, you know, one of the best things about being in India in those days um, and to be female was that you could go into the, well, or a young boy also, you could go into the samadhi. The women would, we all said RT inside the samadhi. So uh, if when the women came for RT, you would 
you could go inside the samadhi with the women. I mean, it was it was a different. We have a picture of my mother in the samadhi in the seventies reading a book. <laughs> She's hanging out. She's hanging out on the windowsill reading a book. I mean, anyway. Um, so being in there with the women Mondali was just tremendous because uh, I was so, I remember being so touched and taken because they were singing um, that song you guys have probably heard where they say, May her Baba, May her Baba, God is love, God is love, May her Baba, May her Baba, Avatar avatar and just the fact that they picked such a simple beautiful i mean it was just i don't know it, it wasn't it wasn't fancy you know what i mean it was just simple love for bob a beautiful love for him so i was in there with them one time while i was going through this thing with baba's name and i realized that i was really repeating his name a lot kind of mentally and i felt like i needed to try to internalize it more and I had this experience in there where there was like it was like in the middle of my chest I started saying Baba's name like 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 a triangle sort of or a pyramid that goes down from the middle of my chest infinitely and I was yelling Baba's name internally downwards and it was like a well and the name would go down 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 and then it hit something don't know what but it hit something and then it would vibrate back up and i was just sobbing and i don't know what what kind of voodoo magic Bob was doing with me <laughs> but um <laughs> something powerful and good so that was um so when i got of course i resolved to give up the drugs and alcohol but i got back to the states and a week later i was using and drinking again but what one thing that happened another thing that happened in india that trip is that i had the great good fortune to meet a kid i'll keep him anonymous who is three years younger than me he was 14 and i was 17. he was already in aa and he had already had a dwi <laughs> which was very impressive to me <laughs> so he he i let him know that i was done and I didn't want to do it anymore and he was trying to help me bless his soul and so he was from the states as well and when we both got back he encouraged me to try going to 12-step meetings and stuff like that which I did um, and that's when I felt that alcohol was still a drug and I didn't like that news at all um, but what I so the so I got back into the all the drugs and addiction again, but now I had the provisional ego. And I feel that that made all the difference. So for a while there, when I was in my active addiction, I was feeling ashamed and I didn't want to look at Baba's picture. I just kind of avoided him. Um, but when it got desperate enough, uh, I just, I couldn't, I, I had to ask his help and I did a lot i begged for his help um and i also um started using the provisional ego with the drug use so i would say it's baba getting high it's baba dri buying drugs it's baba drinking it's baba driving drunk whatever i mean if i could remember you know whatever i was doing um and also in that second phase after india uh i had i had a really bad is not quite the word but i had a mushroom trip that i literally lost my mind and got it back so that was very important because at the age of 18 most people aren't afraid of death and i wasn't but i was afraid of insanity and that experience made me very afraid of losing my mind permanently um i was doing a lot of hallucinogenics as i said I literally, one day somebody asked me, I went to like a doctor's appointment and somebody said to me, uh, your name, ma'am, you know, with the glasses looking up your name, ma'am. And I said, uh, it starts with an L. Let me get back to you. 
<laughs> I didn't even know my name. So those kind of experiences freaked me out pretty bad. So anyway, long story short, I ended up in Greensboro, North Carolina because I wanted to get out of New York and I basically opened a book of colleges and went Wah! and I got uh, UNCG in Greensboro. And um, I had tried to get into acting in New York with my dad and I had some really good experiences and stuff and I didn't know what to do with my life. So I was majoring in acting, which everybody said, you left New York and <laughs> what? <laughs> but anyway, that didn't last long. But um, I brought my best friend and my boyfriend with me um, and I was living in the dorm with my, I was just living in the dorm and my boyfriend and my friend were living in their car in their car. And after a little while, I realized I needed to get out of the dorm because they had rules there and I don't like those things. So um, we got all into the drugs in Greensboro again, the whole thing, it just all continued. Uh, so I got there in the summer of, this is the summer of 89 and um, I had been to some NA meetings, like I said, but I figured it didn't work because it didn't work the way that I was trying to make it work. Um, <clears throat> and so I was continuing to use the provisional ego and then it, a miracle happened. And the miracle was I was looking around the neighborhood of the campus for uh, uh, an apartment to live in. And um, I found, I saw these two girls moving uh, in a really nice apartment and I asked them if they knew if there was any places available etc and they didn't know but they loved the place and we exchanged phone numbers in case uh, an apartment became available and um, so it was I don't remember if it was that day or that week but very soon after that encounter I was walking down the street you know and this place is new to me I'm from New York I've been here a month two months and I literally heard a voice say to me, there's a Narcotics Anonymous meeting in that building across the street. And so I turned and I walked into that building. And that building was one of those kind of campus religious houses. It was a Catholic one. It was called uh, St. Mary's House on Walker Avenue. And um, they had one meeting a week for one hour. And that's what I walked into. And the woman whose phone number I had got over the apartment was in the meeting. She ended up being my first sponsor and I already had her phone number. So Baba just picked me up. He waited till just when I was just ready, put me right where I needed to be. Um, and another fellow showed up in that meeting. Uh, his name is John. Uh, and he's a black Vietnam vet, 20 years older than me. And I found out many years later why, but he reached out to me and saved my life. He saved my life. There's no doubt about it. Um, he's my closest friend. And he's been, he's just now coming around to Baba. <laughs> but anyway, um, so years later, I said like, John, why did you reach out to me? Uh, like I'm this like 18 year old, I still had braces on my teeth, you know, New York white girl, you know, why did you reach out to me? And he said um, that many years prior, he was running around doing drugs with this girl down in Florida who was his best buddy, who was black. And she looked exactly like me. I'm like, that's impossible, <laughs> but okay. And she died, she overdosed, and he and she, he felt that he could make amends to her by helping me. So oh. I got really, really blessed and luck, lucky there. Um, so what happened after that? Uh, you know, I was in and out for a couple of months, but December 6, 1989 is the last time I ever had to, that's when I stopped using all drugs and alcohol um, by, Baba's grace and by, you know, having 12 steps really helped me tremendously. I mean, I, I was 
every single day for years and years and years, at least once a day, uh, probably 15 years. Um, so what happens next? You know, let me break in here for a moment. Yeah. <clears throat> One yeah. of the things that Baba says about the, the provisional <laughs> ego, you know, when you wake up is Baba waking up, when you go to work is Baba going to work. But he also said, and this is really a, a, a hurdle for, I, I have great difficulty with it. When you do, do wrong, think it is Baba doing wrong. And that, so that, is, is, that what you're doing is not in isolation from Baba. Because when it's in isolation from Baba, it takes you a lot longer to get through. But, but it's amazing that you hit upon that early, that it's Baba taking this drug, Baba getting drunk, because it brings him in to the picture and you got through it, wouldn't you say, you got through it much faster. Oh, absolutely. Than, yeah. Yeah. And it took me a long time to realize, hey, wait, if it worked with drugs, maybe it'll work with other things, you know, um, get me through other things faster. Um, but on your point there, that's true, Jeff. I, I, I dawned on me somewhere in the first 10 years of recovery that every time I did something wrong, I would take full credit. And every time I did something right, I would, I would give it to say it was Baba. And I realized... You can't do that. It's it's a it's a package deal. It's either all me or it's all him. So uh, I'm going with Beautiful. it's all him. <laughs> Beautiful. And, and just recently, I had an experience where I'd done something dumb, and I'm at I'm sitting at my computer, and I'm thinking to myself, God, Laura, you're such an asshole. <laughs> Why did you do that? You know. And then I thought, oh, I'm not the asshole. Baba is the asshole. <laughs> <laughs> which I know maybe not easy to hear, but it's a fact because he's everything and we don't even exist. So it has to be him. Um, but right after that, I got a confirmation from Baba that yeah, that's true. And this is something that I've learned and I love so much about Baba is that he comes to each and every one of us so specifically, it's just like perfect on target. I remember, I think it was Rick Chapman said one time that when you look at all the people that met Baba, there are two main similarities in their experiences. One is that he knows you better than you know yourself. And two, that he accepts you 100% exactly who you are. And, and I have found that to be true with my experience with him. Um, but uh, and I think that Baba really wants us to be uh, intimate with him, a hundred, a hundred percent. You know, don't. I've found that hiding any part of me is not going to work. And it, uh, he's inside of me. He knows it all more than I do. So I feel that he appreciates being let in. Uh, you know, on everything, 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 especially the the defects. You know. Um, anyway, I don't want to get caught in my story too long, but basically I stayed clean a long time. I got married, recently got divorced a couple of years ago. And I, I love the, um, the metaphor of like an arrow being drawn back. Uh, I've seen it a lot of times with the publications at Sherry are like, you're like Erich's book, right? Everybody's waiting for Erich's book that Devana wrote. It's not his book. It's Devana's book about Erich. But um, there's all these delays. There's all, just like in Baba's life. And when, you know, he would start something and end it and never, things don't ever go necessarily how you think they will. But I've seen it. And Infinite Intelligence was another example where there's all these things and it seems like Bob is just pulling back the bow and when he lets go, it's, it's gonna go much further. And I feel like that in my life and what I went through in my marriage, which I'm not gonna get into, but it did, I do feel that I'm flying fast and high now. And um, Bob is more alive for me now, my relationship with him, I don't have to really make as much of an effort as I used to. Of course, it's easy for me, right? I work at the Baba bookstore. I'm surrounded by 
Baba and I'm at the in the community and stuff, but um, I, I it just feels more effortless than it's ever felt before. More um, just something that that I want to do, not out of necessity or I don't even know what, but it's just it's just more of a relationship and. People come in the bookstore nowadays and they say, oh, what about this book and that book? And I say, I don't read books anymore. I read quotes <laughs> because Baba's quotes are so rich. I, me and Jeff have a good time exchanging them. I mean, I made some some of my favorites here. Oh, can I read you just one? The, the yeah. best of the best. I'm running out of time. See, I did it. I tried not to, but I did it anyway. Okay, hang on. There's, no, you, you got time. Okay, hold on. Okay, this one is really blowing my socks off in the past year or so. This is from Glimpses, Volume 6. Baba says, then how do you get out of this illusion? There is a remedy. It is to surrender yourself to me, the reality. The antidote is whatever you think or do, feel. Isn't that interesting? Whatever you think or do, feel that you are not the doer. It is Baba as the indweller who is getting it done through you. The antidote is whatever you think or do, feel that you are not the doer. It is Baba as the indweller who is getting it done through you. And then he goes on to say, while feeling this, you have to be natural, very natural, don't pose. No one should pretend to be what he is not. When I tell you to be natural and honest, I have to be honest too. So with infinite honesty, I tell you, I am God in human form. Anyway. There it is, kids, the antidote. <laughs> <laughs> it's right yeah. there, in black and white. Oh, you know what? I forgot the Yusahavas. I can't believe it. So the Yusahavas, real quick, was completely life-changing for me. I, I had gotten in recovery, but I had a lot of low self-esteem, resentments against myself, fear of myself and my defects, and not quite right with Baba 100%. And um, how I got invited to the first one is kind of beyond me because I was, I think it was because of Margaret Bernstein, but I was kind of outside at that point, I was outside the Baba world and crazy land. Um, but I did get invited. I got to go to the first five Yusahavases as a counselor. And then a couple later uh, cooking in the kitchen with Razi. Um, and uh, like one of the workshops was, um, I, I believe the first one was um, being true to yourself. Um, and I, I had these experiences where like one time I, I, there was this girl who was, I was, I guess, 18 or 19. And this girl was, I must have been 19. She was 15 and she, I mentioned that I had gotten clean like a, a year before or something. And she confided in me that she was stuck in drugs and stuff. And, and this girl, I, she was so beautiful and so talented. She could play the guitar. She wrote her own songs. And I was like, what? This girl? You know, like I, I couldn't believe it. She had friends. She was great, smart. And I went back to my cabin that night and I had a little don't worry, be happy card propped up in my mirror in my cabin. I think I was in the cedar nook. And. Um, oh, I forgot another thing to tell you, but anyway, I was in the cedar nook and and I'm saying to Baba, like, why would you give this beautiful girl this curse of addiction? You know, why would you do that to her? Like somebody like that, what would you do? Why would you do that? And I was just kind of conflicted about it. And I went to wash my face and I looked up and the little don't worry, the don't worry, be happy card had a tiny, tiny little tear, like just one drop of water from washing my face had gotten 
So Baba was crying. And for some reason, as soon as I saw that, I knew he was telling me, it's a gift. She's a beautiful girl. You're a beautiful girl. This was, it's a gift for both of you. I don't know how I got that, but just by seeing that tear, I got all that. Um, so that and, and many other uh, experiences. Um, I've always loved to dance. I danced improv dance at the Youth Sahavas and um, that was really healing and great for me. Um, so many things, so many things, but primarily just feeling accepted and loved by my peers and feeling, you know, Bob was showing me that I had value and that he cared about me. You know, I mean, that's what, that's what came out of the use of us, which is huge, really huge. Um, so, okay. So this is the other, I don't know if this is, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be sharing, but this is in my head. So here it comes. So, uh, I think it was 19, around 91 or so I went to, um, I was driving to a 12 step dance thing in, uh, I think it was in Chapel Hill. I was going from Greensboro to Chapel Hill. And it was those days when you had the radio that comes out, you pull the radio out, you know, to keep it safe. And my radio was broken, something was wrong with it. So I didn't have any music. And I was driving by myself and it was dark, it was winter. I was gonna go meet some friends. And I'm driving the car and uh, just to entertain myself with my old acting habits, I started, uh, you know, first I was singing like Christmas carols to myself or whatever. And then I started slipping into like different accents, like British accents and French accents, Mexican accents, all very stereotypical, just entertaining myself. And then all of a sudden I'm speaking in an Indian accent. And I notice that this Indian accent has its own personality. It is not me. And that was a little bit freaky, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna roll with this and I can stop myself. I'm pretty sure I could physically shut my mouth if I need to, but I was just kind of curious. <laughs> <clears throat> and so this person, I still don't really understand it. If anybody else does, you can let me know, but I'm driving the car back roads, dark, and whoever this personality is that took me over says to Baba as if he's in the front seat, how I miss you, Baba, I miss you so much, I, I miss you. And then he says, uh, especially your hands, I miss seeing your beautiful hands, which I had never thought in my at that point in my life that Baba's hands were special, of course they are, but it's not where I was at. So I was like, okay, you like his hands and you miss him. And then he starts getting like really, not aggressive, passionate. He gets very, he starts getting really passionate. And he says, he says, Baba, I know that you are the doer. You are the driver. You are the one doing this and you are doing that. And then he says, she hasn't learned that yet. Talking about me to Baba in the front seat. And I this is crazy, but uh, he says she hasn't learned that yet. And, um, and then he's so passionate. He says, I know you are the driver. You are driving the car, Baba. And I took my hands off the wheel and I shut my eyes. And I did that not for very long, but long enough that when I shut my eyes, I had this vision experience, I don't know what you want to call it, of a yellow um, long stem rose going through the middle of my body, like it was inside of me. And then I put my hands back on the wheel and I stopped talking and I was like, okay, it's over. What the hell was that? I have no idea what that was. Um, but ever since then, Baba has, that's, that could take another hour, but showed me so many things through this yellow rose situation. One of which is that Stella Hernandez, who you guys know, met Baba 
several times, was at the 58 in Baba's house. She said that Baba asked for yellow roses to be brought to his house and that it was his favorite, he had the yellow rose. Um, and I just had all kinds of it. I just lots of experiences, but it's just one of those things. I'm sure all of you have stuff like this where you have a particular thing that he uses to communicate with you. Um, and I say the more the merrier, you know, <laughs> whatever you can get, use it. Um, I've had, I've known people that see hearts all over the place or, um, you know, certain animals, uh, the cardinal, right? Uh, other things like that. A lady came in the bookstore one time and said to me, I just heard that Baba said when you see a, a cardinal that it's him. And I was like, I've never heard that in my life. <laughs> but I was like, who cares? If that makes you think of him, go for it, you know? Um, and Baba's so brother, Joel, used to say that. Oh, did he? Yeah. If you okay. see a, a cardinal uh, through a window. You know, it has to be through a window? Yeah, kind of, you know, looking out a window. I mean, that's kind of as I heard it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, whatever works, um, you know. Um, so what else? So this, so this experience that Baba gave me, and when he said, she doesn't know it yet, that you're not the doer. So not long ago, what, like a, six months ago, six months ago, I'm in meditation. Oh, no, I got up to meditate. And I'm walking out and I'm in a crap mood, which I often am. I really have to work towards getting positive. <laughs> and I'm walking out to sit on the couch where I do all this. And I'm thinking like, oh, God, Baba, like, are you really there? Like, is this really happening? What is this all about? Oh, my God. Bleh. And I had the quote that's in The God Man where he says, God is your innermost self come into my head and I'm like okay well maybe that'll inspire me all right God is your innermost self uh, so I write it down in my journal God is your innermost self okay uh, and I'm thinking like is he really my innermost self he's inside of me he's outside of me what's this all about and then I pick up this meditation book it's uh Mark Nepo the awakening book I don't know if you guys know it that's really nice and I sometimes look at it for inspiration and I sometimes don't, but this particular day I picked it up and I kid you not, in the first sentence, the phrase innermost self is there. I mean, what are the chances, right? And for me, it was an experience of like rewind and I rewinded like, okay, I got up and I had these thoughts and Baba put that thought in my head. He put that he put the attitude, he put the thought, he put it in the book, he's having me recognize it. And it was just kind of a twilight zone experience. And then, um, and then I was just, you know, you get these little, I don't know what to call them, downloads or gifts from Baba. And they're just, I live for them. I really do. I live for them. And this particular one was so great. And it kind of wraps up to that she hasn't learned that one yet. Like I'm, it's taken the the whole uh, provisional ego to a whole nother level it, for me. It's like, it's no longer, I'm just saying it to like deal with whatever issue. It's like really trying. I mean, who knows how to do this, right? <laughs> who knows, but at least trying and experimenting with, um, you know, like that quote I read, feel that you are not the doer. Is Baba as the indweller getting it done through you? Getting it done through you. Isn't that fascinating? What exactly are you getting done through us? Well, everything, everything. And it's not just what he does, what we do. It's what we think. That's fantastic to me. I mean, it, and so, okay, I'm getting carried away, but two things. So then I, I, I'm at a party and I overhear my good friend, Al Grasso, who's over here, quoting Ramakrishna from a distance, like six tables away. And Baba said Ramakrishna was a perfect master. And I'm like, and I thought I heard something about a doer. And I was like, what? And I go over, I was like, Al, Al, what was that? What was that? And I hope I get it right. Correct me if I'm wrong, Al. The quote is something like, I have it, but I'm not going to look it up. He says, 
to realize that you are not the doer is the culmination of all spiritual longing and all spiritual practice and longing or longing and practice. It's the culmination. That's it. Like that is where I want to go. And that's just Baba was. And, and I feel like, you know, everybody, Baba said there are as many paths to God as there are individuals. Everybody's got their own way, their own downloads, their own cookie trail to get back to him. But for me, that has just been huge lately. And then what he layered on top of that next was this beautiful um, Zen master quote where he says, if you're blaming other people, you're not on the path. If you blame only yourself, you're halfway there. And when you blame no one, when you realize there is no one to blame, you've arrived. And that's it. There's no one to blame. There's no one to blame. How could there be anyone to blame? There's only Mayor <laughs> Baba. He's all that exists. And it's such a relief. It's just magnificent. So um, so this is this is the, you know, just a couple of examples of like Baba's just wicked alive in my life. He's so alive. And he's given me stuff like this, and it's uh it's carrying me on, it's helping me get closer. And and I'm not doing any of it. I'm not doing any of it. Isn't that fabulous? I mean, he's he's the doer. It's just it's just it's the best. I and <laughs> I was going down to the southeast gathering with my kids in the back seat. Um another practice I like to do is something I heard. I don't remember if it was Kitty or Elizabeth, but they had a practice of saying, Yes, Baba, thank you, Baba, no matter what was going on. And so my kids, when they hear me saying, yes, Baba, thank you, Baba, they're like, uh-oh, mom's just... <laughs> It must be bad. But anyway, so we're going down to the Southeast Gathering, and yeah, I'm still eating. open, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm get... just on the Zoom. Oh, wait a second. I'm on Zoom right now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm driving down to the Southeast Gathering, and I get pulled over by a cop for speeding. And, and the cop comes over to the car and I'm thinking to myself, no one is to blame. <laughs> I told my kids, isn't this great? No one is to blame. <laughs> and we all had a good time. And guess what? You have a ticket either way. Why blame yourself and make it? I mean, either way, it's still there. Um, but that's been just really so helpful for me and another metaphor that i've been loving you know baba says to love the one and the many rather than the many and the one and so here we are all one right these are all and now what don't take offense but i consider myself and the rest of you puppets because baba says um that he is the indweller He's the indweller, which makes me think of a puppet with a hand indwelling inside it, the, the doer. And it's actually, it's helped. I told my friends, when I die, put on my tombstone, Baba's puppet. That's all I want. Just Baba's puppet. That's what I aim for. And it actually helps me tremendously dealing with other people because it's like entertaining. I'm like, wow, that is a hell of a puppet you got there, Bob. I mean, it is. <laughs> But it's a compliment because we're we're his puppets. We're not just, you know, we're not two dimensional. We're like the most magnificent puppets. We're puppets with imagination and memory and and uh, intellect and instinct and intuition and creativity. We're great puppets, but we're puppets, you know, and, and it does. It helps me a lot with interacting with other people. Um, and it's helped me in the past to just think like, you're a pup. That's Baba in them. That's one way to do it. But for some reason, I like saying it's a puppet. It's uh, it's more entertaining, maybe. Uh, keeps me going longer. Um, but I don't know. That's that's the kind of stuff that I'm focusing on lately, and. Um, just trying to keep them with me all the time. I have a, a mantra that I say to myself 
many, many times a day, which is help me love you more, help me love you more, help me love you more. Um, but again, it's not me, it's him. So, uh, I don't know, that's, uh, I yeah. guess, I'm at a guess. Yeah, we'll see if we have some questions, but uh, beautiful, you know, you really shared right from the, the last drop of everything about yourself. And But we have some questions, so um, let's... So, Rich. Well, for everyone in the audience, most everyone here is probably met Laura or Sheila or been in the bookstore. So um, that's really where my experience comes from. I remember when uh, I showed up at the bookstore once uh, when uh, uh, outside the original bookstore, outside there was a carriage and that was her first child. And so I guess what I'm really asking is, so how, for a moment there, Laura, when you were starting off and you were talking about the story, I'm thinking, Man, if I was her son, uh, hi, mom, huh? how's it going today? <laughs> so I'm curious how your sons fit into your life with Baba. I have three sons. Wow. Um, they were all, uh, they're beautiful, beautiful souls. Um, I don't know if you guys, what's that guy's name? Alan, the guy who was. Um, Manukian? No, no, no. The one who was um, Don Stevens's boyfriend back in the fifties, who lives in. Jamaica. Oh yeah, Alan. Um, Starts with a Y. Ewell. Yeah, Ewell. Alan Ewell. Yeah. Alan Ewell. Ewell told me one time when I was in India with him that Baba told him that the children are always more spiritual than the parents. Interesting. So that is definitely the case with my kids. Uh, they just, um, you know, I've never been one to try to push Baba down my kid's throat. I'm not like that at all. And their father, Tommaso, is, as he explains it, half Catholic, half atheist, half Baba lover. <laughs> so, um They've they've just come to Baba there on their own, hundred percent. I mean, of course they knew who he was. They'd been to the, but we didn't force him to like, be in the Christmas chorus or you know like nothing. Um, they did. I did take my older two to India when my oldest was nine and the middle one was four, and the oldest one insisted on learning all the prayers he went to arty more more than we did we would be sleeping and he'd be at rt he'd pick a flower make sure it went on the samadhi uh, he's got his own relationship with baba he meditates every day now i mean it took me till i was 50 to start meditating anyway um and then the middle one just went to his first youth sahabas last year which is really cool and when I went to pick him up, he said it was the best six days of his life. His name is Darwin, after Darwin Shaw, who was used to attend the youth Sahavas and give talks. Uh, he was amazing. Um, and my youngest, his name is Erich Meher, and he wants to go to India like there's no tomorrow. He can, tells me constantly, I want to go to India, I want to go to India. So he's nine, we need to get him to India, but it just hadn't happened yet. Um, but they're 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 great. They're beautiful. They they know about Baba. They're just on, on their own. You know, they're all on their own track. Whatever happens with them, but I'm not worried about them. Yeah, they're great kids. Really, it's beautiful to see. The Baba world is expanding from within for sure. Tony. Tony. Yeah, I, I, hi, Laura. Um, hi, Tony. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just want to share. It, it, you know, I, um, I've known you on one level or another for a very long time because I'd say from 1990 until whenever your mom and dad moved to Myrtle Beach, that was my other home. 
and they had meetings. I guess it was Thursday night, and um, I would, if it was my daughter's week with me, I would bring my daughter, who was like three and four and five, but otherwise I'd come alone. The nicest Baba meetings ever. You would come in, and your mom would make dinner. And we'd hang out in the kitchen for a long time, and then somebody would say, let's go inside now and have the meeting. <laughs> and they'd ask me to sing something or play something. I remember you mainly going out. <laughs> like <laughs> like after, after the meal part, kind of not necessarily staying for the meeting. But I've known you for all these years. I've seen you, and we've talked lots of times at Myrtle Beach. And I'm just feeling so delighted now because I feel like... I'm really meeting you now. Oh, and cool. and it's like now I've got the real person to connect with, not just this interconnection thing, you know. Yeah. And uh, thank you. The vulnerability, the openness, the, you know, I love it. It's 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 a pleasure to meet you yeah. <laughs> again. Thanks, yeah. It's great to see you here. I'm glad yeah. you're here. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Here's this coming from Los Angeles. You probably know. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hey, Laura. Hi, so I, I feel like if there was ever like a ba Baba lifeline, you might be the one person. Have you read every book that is in Sherryar? And Okay. Thank nope. you. I was hoping you would be human. <laughs> You're hoping what? That you were as human as I imagined. <laughs> no, that's what I said. I just read quotes. I, I focus on a quote for months and months and months. I mean, I've read a lot of Baba books, but yeah, by far. You have a favorite quote? Probably the one I just read, but I've got thousands more. I will get your, I'll start sending you some. I literally have an app with 700 and some quotes in it. How do you have an? Is it's, that an app? Other people? Yeah, can it's have? called Quotafile, and I uh, collect all sorts of. One of my favorites right now is uh, Saint Teresa of Avila. She said, "To know nothing is everything," and I feel like that's really, really key because that's part of us getting in our own way, right? As if that's actually possible, but you know what I mean. Like, we don't know anything. Everything is good, basically. I mean, no matter what we think, we're we're off, right? What is that Hafez quote where he says, um, whatever the master does is for the the best. You know it, Jeff. Yeah. In Mondale it's Hall. For the highest benefit to all concerned, yeah. Right. I mean, we just don't we have to accept that we just don't know. And I think that's there's really there's a quote there's a quote of Baba's that that Bao used to share where he says Knowledge is knowing that there's nothing to know. <laughs> nice. That's really I mean, good. all the knowledge about illusion, I mean, is it really knowledge? <laughs> yeah. And, and then yeah. My, my second question, if I could jump in. Um, you and Jeff have a lot of similarity in the aspect that you're kind of Baba 24-7. And you get to connect with Baba lovers from all over the world because as someone said at the beginning Sherry going to the bookstore is a, a must do when going to Myrtle Beach and your heart I don't know Sheila like I know you so you are the the magnet for me for that space and um I how has it you've been doing this you didn't say when you started Sherry Art started working at Sherry Art in your life? Did I you actually... started in uh, 1999 with Sherry Art Foundation and the bookstore in 2001. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, yeah. it, you, you've, you and Sheila have made it a, a, a really wonderful, warm place to come and, and be received. And that, the personal, the personal aspect, not just being friendly, but being personal, which is, a whole di much deeper thing than just being friendly and that you know and you give the people a feeling of belonging and 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 that's just that's that's kind of what the mandali did <clears throat> they made us feel uh like we belonged and we were ha happy to be seen and everything mm. <clears throat> yeah 
Yeah, but uh, well, other that's, people that's... have done the bookstore. Other people have done the bookstore, but it, you know, it wasn't quite. They approached it a little bit more business-like, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I've always loved the. I, I, when I first got asked to go in the bookstore, I, I had started off um, helping Sherry R with their archives. And I would show up in my sweatpants whenever I felt like it and work as long as I liked and leave. And then um, they asked me to work in the bookstore and I was like, oh man, I have to like show up on time and be there on a regular basis. I was very stupid about it. But as soon as I got in there, I just loved it. I was, I, my one of my best friends is a um, astrologer and she said astrologically your best relationship is with your job <laughs> so i feel like that i feel like i'm in a relationship with the bookstore it's a really good one yeah so can i throw in one more quote since she asked me about yeah in fact in fact yeah this quote and then is uh, kind of late for people on the East Coast. Okay. So we'll have a few moments after this quote. Okay. Or, or even if you have another one, you know. Okay, this one. Baba says, I use the circumstances of everyday life to liberate my devotees, but I use them in a way that is beyond comprehension, people <laughs> of the intellect, beyond. So you must not expect me to provide you with blueprints of my plans, either individual or universal. Have faith in me, supreme faith. I am always with you, directing you as my own vehicle. And I told that to somebody and they said, oh, maybe I'll be a, a golf cart. And I was like, no, don't do that. <laughs> But you can be your, figure out what your own vehicle is. He's always with you, directing you as your own vehicle. As, as his own vehicle. Read it once again, and then we'll have a few moments of silence. Now I'll stop. Okay. I use the circumstances of everyday life to liberate my devotees, but I use them in a way that is beyond comprehension of the intellect. So... You must not expect me to provide you with blueprints of my plans, either individual or universal. Have faith in me, supreme faith. I am always with you, directing you as my own vehicle. Yeah, wow. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Wow. Jay Baba. Laura, I think you, uh, before you started talking this evening, I, I thought you're going to be talking more. <laughs> you know, you're going to be asked to talk here and there, I can imagine. You know, but you spoke beautifully and very openly. It's a whole journey, and look at Baba has, where where Baba has gotten you to now, through all of that. And and I always feel like you know you're. You'll have empathy for so many people because you've been there yourself. Mm -hmm. you, know? mm -hmm. you can't you know you can't hold your head too high. For sure. <laughs> wow. But thank you, really. Thank you. That was just be so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for and asking. It just, and Thanks and for just listening. so spontaneous. I mean, it's not like you, uh, you know, you had notes or anything. You know what I mean? You just kind of let it flow. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> yeah. 
No. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah. See you at the bookstore. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, it Laura. Was wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful yep. Beautiful. Jay Baba. Yeah. Jay Baba. Thank you so much, Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Yeah. Thank we got you. even Shaney out here to. <laughs> oh, Shaney. Love you. Yeah. Hi, Jay Baba, everybody. Hey. Long time got, no see. Yes, yeah, very long time. Lovely to see you, and thank you. Yeah. I I got so much from your sharing. Oh, thanks, Shani. So glad. So you're here. so yeah. much. Yes, Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Yeah, and and uh, Sabine there, and and <laughs> Johannes. This is like five in the morning in Germany. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, yeah, time to go back to bed now. Oh, yeah. I really <laughs> enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Couch potatoes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's wonderful. Al uh, Alan Manukin and uh, Adrian are somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, but thank you, really. That was. Thank you, Jake. And I, like I think, oh yeah, there's nuts rain. We can't go. We can't go until she uh, says the says the final oh, word. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, we have to hear that voice. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank yeah. you, Tishu. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We got people from Florida and India and yeah. Hey, Jeff, how are you feeling? My back is still hurting me. I, it's just amazing. Hmm. I, I've got I've got this uh, massage gun that I've been. Oh, I guess it's uh, there. It is. <laughs> ah. and I've been applying during during this time here while I was listening. Yeah. You're a good sport. Yeah. No, that was fantastic. Really, boy, I'm so glad. And it was a. It was somebody from India that that said, "Ask Laura." Ask Laura. Really? Yeah. Well, that's funny. You know. Yeah. And it was just perfect. Adrian, Adrian. And this, oh, I hope, I, I mean, I hope this is recorded. I think it was, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it is. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. No, because, it, you know, people, uh, oh, there's Adrian and Alan. Uh, this gets recorded and people, I mean, several hundred people will <laughs> or will watch this. Can I go by? And it'll be helpful. Billions yeah. of you. Yeah. And not your future employers, you know. You don't. Want them to... <laughs> yeah, I'm done. I'll have to work at Jerry R forever now. Laura, <laughs> your story is so dynamic. Yeah. Last, I was just bouncing with a few people the other day about your dad. Uh -huh. I got had to had to take his boat from the marina, the Briarcliff Marina. We were in the original kitchen, and this was like 19, I don't know. Baba may have still been living, it's possible. And my buddy, Chris Parker, we were both from Texas. Somehow we were at the center together, and we and, and Craig got, somehow things got cooking on the phone, and he had to take the boat trying to remember the reason he had to take the boat the sailboat up the waterway to the um uh, what's north the the port inlet and then down the beach back down the beach to where you live to adjacent to your house at windy hill well and then there was a task to do, a reason for doing that. I can't remember what it was. And Chris Parker and I wanted to go with them. And the bait was that he told us about the sail. 
Baba's face on the sail, and we just had to see that. And it was, we suffered. We all three, the three of us suffered. I bet. But the, but the sea, having the sail with us was worth, made it work. It was that <laughs> a, a dying, and I'd love to see it again. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to dig it out. All, Maybe I, can I wish it. you could all yeah. see Baba's face on that sail. It, it was very a cool. Wonderful painting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had people. to anchor uh, out to the beach, off the beach, anchor the boat, and swim to your house. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm lying. Your father was so macho. So gracious. <laughs> he waited and swam and waited and got a dinghy at the house and came and got Chris and I. And we went to the house dry in the dinghy. <laughs> and the I dinghy. said, I'm hey, better supper, maybe, and then took us back to the center. The dinghy was called the J Baba. <laughs> <Jay Baba. laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Laura, I don't know, I don't know if we could get Adrian to sing a song. Probably not. Uh, on the on the dime. Oh. Sorry, I don't know how to work the phone. Zanel. We don't know how to unmute it. Uh, okay. Well, we're unmuted now. Uh, okay. Okay. I have a very short little song that I feel like is perfect for your story, Laura. And because <clears throat> I have the mic now, I get to say that was awesome, and you are super awesome. And thank you so much for sharing so naturally and honestly. It was really amazing to get to know you better and get to hear your story. And I just love the realness that you shared with Baba, that you shared with all of us. It's really inspiring and made us happy um okay i'll sing this song song it's really short. and um you can sing along everybody but only if you mute yourselves if you don't mute yourself they will sound absolutely wonderful but also chaotic so or you could just listen oh, but i don't want to put it on i have want to have the thing lifted so it gets better okay okay, oh, okay. alan you sing along. sure i'm gonna hold it okay Okay, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> it's all right, it's okay. I'm gonna love you anyway. It's all right, it's okay. I'm gonna love you anyway. It's all right, it's okay, I'm gonna love you anyway. It's all right, it's okay, I'm gonna love you anyway. It's all right, it's okay, I'm gonna love you anyway. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right, it's okay, I'm gonna love you anyway. Oh, it's all right. It's okay. I'm going to love you anyway. It's all right. It's okay. I'm going to love you anyway. It's all right. It's okay. I'm going to love you anyway. It's all right. It's okay. I'm going to love you anyway. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> It's all right, it's okay. It's all right, it's okay. I'm gonna love you anyway. It's all right, it's okay. I'm gonna love you anyway. Oh, that's that was, that was... <laughs> Hi, Jimmy Bob. Yay. Hey, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Hey. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Hello, Paris. Hello. Hello. Wonderful. Well, 
I guess I guess we'll probably uh, ought to head into um, the beyond beyond here, some mm -hmm. of us <laughs> on the East Coast. But thank you so again, and uh, yeah, much much Thanks. love, Laura. Laura. Yeah. Hey Baba, everyone. Hey Baba. Hey Baba. Thank you, Jeff. Baba. Yeah, sure. Um, Jay Baba, thank you. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Uh, Jay Baba. It's all right. It's okay. I love you. Anyway. <laughs> Rosalie. <laughs> oh, that is Rosalie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can't see you, but we know the voice. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. I'm going to love you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All please, right. please give your love, my, my love to your mom, Laura. I yeah. will, Tony. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well. Okay. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Baba, everybody. Hey, Baba. Hey, Baba, everyone. Hey, Baba. Hey, Baba. Hey, Baba. Hey, Baba. Hey, Baba.